church. How's everybody doing this morning? Yeah, that's pretty bad. How's everybody doing this morning? Good, good, good. You are alive. I wanted to say good to see you. And uh, just to also just thank you for your giving towards our building campaign. We are continuing to build and get that thing going. I don't know if you've noticed or drove by there recently, but if you drove by south on Beach Express, kind of looked over to your right at County Road 12, you'll see an airplane hangar over there, uh, which is really called our church. <laughs> the whole end of it's blown out. Have you all seen that? Anybody seen that? Uh, man, you need to check that out. It's a, it's a, you really could drive a Boeing 747 probably up in there and park it. But uh, we're just blowing that out so we can expand the auditorium for the thousands of people that we're going to be bringing into that sanctuary. Somebody say amen. Come on. Jesus said, don't wait and say four more months until it's harvest. And look now, the fields are white until harvest. And so we are looking and seeing that take place right before our eyes. I want to encourage you to be back on Wednesday nights right here where we're praying. We're in the midst of 21 days of prayer. We're seeking the Lord for our community, for our nation, and for his blessing and an awakening across our country. So please be here for that. We've been having a really sweet time the last several weeks, and you don't want to miss that. It is really, really good time. Well, before I jump into our message, I, from time to time, you have these wonderful little surprises that come your way that you weren't expecting. And this morning, one of those happened to me. Um, after second service, I went outside to greet a few people, and lo and behold, um, ghosts from my past showed up in the form of Frankie and Denise Chu and their family. I want them to stand up. Would you please stand up and greet everybody? I want y'all to meet these people. Great, awesome. So the greatest people you'll ever want to know, they were our youth pastors when we were pastoring in Missouri years and years ago. And, uh, and that was just one of the things that they did, right? I mean, he ran the camera and uh, the audio and did the youth and played drums. I mean, I, I, like, that was just a couple things he did, you know what I'm saying? And uh, everybody needs a person like that in their life. And Frankie and Denise have been that, and they've been faithful friends of ours ever since. I mean, they're the kind of friends that when you go out of town, you come back and find out that they literally broke into your house and took all the labels off your canned goods in your entire pantry. <laughs> That's the kind of friends you need. <laughs> we had a great time. I remember uh, one thing, sorry, just going down memory lane for just a second. But uh, So back in those days, you know, we had um, all the songs were up on a slide screen. You know, you had these little transparency things, the transparent overhead, you know, slide, you know, overhead, you know what I'm talking about? So, so anyway, we thought we would get really fancy and we would get by a projector, you know, like a, like a project, like that right there. And uh, we're like, man, we're, so we invested a large amount of money to buy that thing right there and to hang it down for a second. So we were so excited, finally came and it was Frankie's job to climb up the scaffolding and install this projector. And we're all excited. We're all just kind of watching this thing unfold. And uh, as he's kind of putting it up there to bolt it into the ceiling, somehow it just came out of his hands. Came in, hit the scaffolding, and then just fell, just like in slow motion, just I'm seeing ding, 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 thousands of dollars, just woo, woo, hit the floor, hit the floor. And everyone was just like stunned. It was like, and Clyde... <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I said, all I could say was, oh, that can't be good. You know, that's all, that's all I could say. Remember, that's all I said. And that's the only thing he was said. He climbed down from the scaffolding, picked it up, plugged it in, and it still worked. Only God could do that. I'm saying only God could have done that for you. Yeah, he loves you, Frankie. Anyway, get to, get to meet this couple that the favor of God's on their life, no doubt about it. Uh, two guys were golfing, and one guy was reminiscing and talking about it. He has some complaint actually to his friend about, you know, child, re rearing a child and growing children. And he goes, you know, in my day, you know, when I got in trouble, that my dad would send me to my room for punishment. He goes, but now I send my, room, my son to his room for punishment. And in his room, he has a cell phone. He's got a computer. He's got Xbox, all sorts of video games, a flat screen TV and surround sound. And his friend said, well, that's not good. He goes, I know it's not good. He says, well, so what, what are you going to do? He goes, well, I've already come up with a solution. And he said, what's that? He goes, I send them to my bedroom. <laughs> How many parents don't know what I'm talking about, right? You don't have nothing in your bedroom. You got a stinking, you know, satellite capsule going on over there in your son's room. Oh, my. 
Well, times are changing, aren't they, church? So we thought we would do a little series for a few weeks called Steady As She Goes. Anybody ever heard of that term, steady as she goes? Frankly, it's a nautical term used mostly. And it's when a captain of a ship is wanting to give directions to the helmsman, the person steering the wheel, and tell him what to do. And so he would tell the direction, give the direction, the helmsman repeat it back to him out loud, which is appropriate, what you're supposed to do, and they would go on their way. Well, steady as she goes was one of those terms, a nautical term that the captain would say from time to time to the helmsman. It meant, actually it was music to the ears of the sailors. When they heard the captain say, steady as she goes, then what that meant was all the sails, full sail, everybody, all, everything up, uh, rudders in place, and now we are going to experience a little bit of some momentum. We're going to be able to fly down a little bit straight. It also meant uh, don't look to the right or don't look to the left. It was also used by captains many times when they were under fire, when they were perhaps going through a channel or into a bay or something that they were going to invade and there were minefields around or explosions going around them and the captain would just stay very stoic and very um, focused and would say, steady as she goes. Steady as she goes, meaning don't veer to the right or left, just keep on moving forward. And it was, it was something that, you know, you would say if you felt, you know, if you, if you were the one in control and you were in command. Well, I felt like that was kind of what the word of the Lord dropped into my heart. That in this season that we're in, I, I feel like the Lord is wanting to say to us, church, steady as she goes. There's a lot of minefields around here. There's a lot of things going off and a lot of damage has taken place. We, we got all sorts of things going on that any one of these things would be almost too much for one generation or one culture. But when you put all the things that are going together in one year, in a little time period of just a few months, you can begin to get a little uneasy about where you're standing and where, what's going on at this present moment. And I want you to know that we have a captain who's in control, and he's given the order to the church, the body of Christ, steady as she goes. Can everybody say that to your, turn to your neighbor and tell him, steady as she goes. Can you tell that? Now, I don't know about you, but I... I I watch movies from time to time, and my wife, I, she likes chick flicks. You know what I'm talking about, a chick flick? When I say a chick flick, just like a little love story. It's got a ooey, gooey stuff, you know. I love you, you left me, but I love you still, and all this kind of stuff. And, and then, in fact, this past week, I earned a few brandy points by watching a chick flick with my wife. But we watched it. I ate popcorn, didn't say him too much. And, um, and, uh, and, and, but, but what I love to do is watch these action shows. Come on, how many men we got in the house? Come on, just if it's not blowing up, you know, body parts aren't laying out around everybody, it's really not a movie I'm interested in. I, I want to see. I, I want to see some action taking place. And uh, so anyway, years ago, I watched this show, called, this movie called Hunt for Red October. It's about this Russian submarine that's defecting. The, cap, the captain of the submarine is wanting to defect to the, to the United States. And, and so he kind of goes rogue from uh, the Russian uh, fleet of submarines. And, uh, and so... The Americans don't know if he's for them or for us or against us. And so, so anyway, in part of this movie, the Americans literally fire a, a torpedo at the submarine. And uh, the submarine is down deep into the water and it's going down to like a channel and there's walls on both sides. It's trying to get away from being detected and it's going down this deep channel and now there's a torpedo right on its tail and... Sean Connery, now you got to follow along with me. This is just an illustration, okay? Sean Connery in this illustration is God, okay? I know it's a far stretch, but just go with me for a little bit. If you can imagine, Sean Connery, the captain, in a sense, is giving the directions to the submarine, um, you know, individuals that are the helmsmen, what to do next. Kind of gives you a little picture of what I'm trying to talk about. So real quickly, can we show this little video? Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? Come on, got a little bit of a... <laughs> Taste the red. All of y'all are going to go watch Red Hunt for Red October when you leave this morning. I know what you're going to do. Um, and so, but did, did you see Sean Connor just in the face of 
danger, in the face of peril. He just remained steadfast, stoic, determined. And I believe that's what God is saying to us as the church. I got this. God is saying, I'm, I'm in control. It's, it's okay. You can trust me. I'm at the helm. I'm, I'm, at the, I'm on the bridge. I, I'm not, I haven't gone anywhere. I know the, the past. I know the future. I know the path to take. I know what's around. And, and you can trust me. How many know you can trust the God that we have? Come on. Amen? Can you, can you trust him? You can trust him. You can. I'm, a while back, Melissa and I were, we were uh, given an opportunity to, uh, to take a little, little cruise. And um, so we, we, we thought, well, this will be a lot of fun. And so we went on this little cruise and having a fun time. And she said, well, listen, I, I want to go to bed early. I'm like, are you kidding me? There's free food all over this boat. How can you go to bed early? This is crazy. And she goes, no, I just, I'm tired. I was like, well, I'm, I got to go find some ice cream. And uh, which, which I think the greatest thing about a cruise is just simply that fact. You can eat at any time of the day and there's always free food available. So I went on my journey. I found some ice cream and I was eating my little ice cream cone and I'm leaning over the rail at the very back of the boat and I'm staring into the into the back of where we had been and looking at the white water that had been churned up by the motors of this engine and you could hear the engine kind of in the background. The wind was kind of blowing across the, the, uh, the deck and it's beautiful evening. The sun, uh, the moonlight was out and just had a wonderful time and watching where we had just been. And so I wandered towards the front of the deck and I'm eating my ice cream cone and, I, and, and now there's no light and I can't even see anything in the front and it's just pitch black. And, uh, and the, th the thought came to me, you know, I'm on this big mammoth ship and I'm trusting someone. I don't even know his name. I don't even know where he came from. I don't know uh, anything about this man. I, I, I don't know a thing. And yet I'm sitting on here eating an ice cream cone. Trusting that when I go to bed tonight, when I wake up, perhaps we will be in a beautiful port and I'll open my window and I'll see this incredible sand and a wonderful island and I'll think to myself, how in the world did I get here? This is absolutely amazing and I can do that. Why? Because I trust this man up on a bridge called a captain. Now, if I can do that in the natural, how, many, how much more do you think we should be able to trust our God who created this whole ship to begin with, come on, who knows everything about us, even the hairs on our head? We can trust this God. We can trust this God. We, we find over and over in the Bible where Jesus was unmoved by the situations going around him. In fact, one story tells us he was asleep in the bottom of this boat and the disciples think he's, they're about to drown. They think they're about to lose their life. They shake and wake him. Aren't you, aren't you concerned about what's going on here? Do you not notice what's happening? And he gets up and he, you know, peace be still and the whole storm calms him. And it goes away and, and just that fast. And he rebukes the disciples. You have little faith. And I'm here to tell you that we have this kind of a God who in the midst of the storm, he's not moved. He's Sean Connery. He's just like unmoved. He knows what's happening. He's just counting to himself. Seven, six, five. Full rudders, fright, starboard. I don't know what he was saying. But you know what I'm saying? God is declaring something from his throne room into the earth. And we can trust him. He's not moved. Perhaps... We're looking at the middle of a storm in our lives. But in the midst of the storm, I've got some good news for you. Look at this, Psalms chapter 20. Let's read this. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. And may he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. Now, the word Zion is, a, is a, another word for the church. It's, you, anytime you see the word Zion, just replace it with the word church. It's what it's speaking to us of. May he remember all of your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. May we shout for joy over your victory and lift up our banners in the name of our God. May the Lord grant all your requests. Now this I know. The Lord gives victory to his anointed. He answers him from his heavenly sanctuary with the victorious power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots. 
In other words, some trust in the stock market, some trust in their retirement, some trust in their talent, some trust in their personality, some trust in um, their own wisdom, uh, and some trust in horses and some in chariots. But we, we trust what? In the name of the Lord our God. Everybody say that with me. The name of the Lord our God. They are brought to their knees. They fall or they fail, the Bible goes on to say. Many times in the scripture, we've seen people who've experienced the steadiness of, of our God who's in control. We see Moses leading three million people through the wilderness and finds himself with his back up against the sea, the, de- the Red Sea, and then mountains on both sides and the Egyptian army coming hard on their tail. And, and, and they're, they're in a situation. There's no escape. God loves putting us in situations where there's no escape. Why? Because... We have to find out that in our hand is a staff and there's an anointing upon our life. And God says to Moses, you speak into that sea. And Moses spoke into the sea. He raised up the power that he had in his hand. And God caused the sea to separate. God caused the whole Israelite camp to come to the other side. And he vanquished the enemy from their midst. I'm here to tell you that you can remain steady at the helm. And you can continue to go forward steady as she goes. Why? Because you have a God. I have a God who's in control of everything and he knows the end from the beginning the first the last he's the alpha the omega and everything in between come on somebody say amen this morning we have to look no further than joshua he's in the fight for his life he's trying to gear he's just trying to grind it out with his men and they're they're finally putting an end to an enemy that had been attacking him for so long and joshua cries out to god says god i need some help and god says what you need he goes i need some more time i need some more time and god goes that's no problem for me and god takes the mighty big son and just puts his hands around it and he just holds it still for a few moments and gives joshua a couple more hours to vanquish the enemy and he goes that enough time you ready? Oh, that's good. Okay, okay. All right, there we go. How many know if God can hold the sun in its place, how much more can God take care of you and the little virus going around in the country? Come on. The Bible's full of these stories of how God is always in control. Isaiah 60 verse 1, it says to us, here's the challenge, arise, shine. For your light has come. Everybody say, has come. come. Not your light might come. Aren't you glad it doesn't say your light possibly could come? Aren't you glad it doesn't say your light is almost gone and I hope you make it out? No. Arise, shine. Arise. Rise up. Arise and shine for your light has come. It's here. You already have it inside. In fact, all of us here have a light inside, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. Now see, darkness even covers the earth. Thick darkness is over the people's but. Oh, thank you, Lord, for the but the Lord. Everybody say, but the Lord. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Even nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Let me tell you, let me just encourage you a little bit this morning. God hasn't left the throne. He's still in control, and there's a lot of easy in control. But he is putting a light, and has put a light inside of you, and he is challenging you, and telling you, and reminding you, when it is dark, this is the time to shine. And listen, when there's a lot of questions going on out there and a lot of confusion and a whole lot of fear. This is the time for the church to rise up with boldness and strength and faith and go, hey, the glory of the Lord has risen upon us. Arise, shine, for your light has come. You don't need a light when it's all bright outside. You need a light when it's dark. So shine. Not your neighbor telling him, go ahead and shine. Just go ahead and shine. This is the time. Well, this week and next week and maybe in the week after, I don't know how it's going to plan out, but we want to just talk for a few minutes about the God who was and the God who will be. The God of their past and the God of our future. You know, ever since I was about 21 years old, which was just a couple years ago, I've been praying for America. I've been praying for an awakening in our land. I have 
read history books. I've gone to Washington, D.C. and stood on the great Washington Mall and prayed with thousands and thousands of other Christians for our land. I've done prayer walks across D.C. and other historical places. I moved my entire family to the spiritual roots of our nation up in Salem, Massachusetts for a couple of years. Just to, One of the reasons was to get a hold of our spiritual roots as a nation. I love this nation. I mean, I love it with everything I have, as many as, of you do. And my heart's been ripped out, and so I'm sure yours as well, by what you've seen transpire in the last several months in our nation. But as I have prayed for America and its future, I've become aware that, that I cannot really go forward without looking backwards. Let me say it like this. I can't move forward without reaching back because what is going on ahead of me has a lot to do with what's already gone behind me. In other words, the kingdom of God did not start with me. It just continues with me. When, when you were born and come out of your mother's womb and the doctor slapped you on the hiney, can I say hiney? Hiney's okay. The kingdom of God didn't suddenly start. Suddenly, oh, the kingdom of God starts. Look at here, right here. No, the kingdom of God has started 2,000 years with Jesus ago. We can start there and now it's continued on with you. You're just a part of the process. And so I can't focus on something for today without the context of the past being in my view. God has always had a lot to say about this generations that have gone before us. This was, if you understand how even America came into existence, you have this incredible love for what God is doing even now. This is, this is one of the strategies of the enemy to wipe away our understanding of our past. If I understand my past, I can navigate my future. Listen, the, the history is important because it, it always repeats itself. If I wipe away my past, I have no idea to learn what is going to happen because nothing's ever new. And so we see this God who is concerned about the days gone by. We see a God who speaks to us of leaving inheritances to our children and to our grandchildren. A God who speaks to us of speaking wisdom and teaching our children and our grandchildren truths. We see a God who talks to us about generational blessings and generational curses, and a God who honors those who have gone before us. We see a God who uh, tells us, listen, you need to find yesterday's path. You need to restore past foundations. You need to repair yesterday's breaches. You need to rebuild and not start over. You need to recapture what you've lost so you can move on. We see a God who is so connected with the future, but yet still connected to the past. And we find ourselves in the continuum of time, trying to touch uh, both of them together. God has brought us to this point where he wants us to understand that we have a vital role to play in this very thing that's being played out in front of us in, in this time frame that we are in, that he needs you. He needs you to be awake. He needs you to get up on the bridge. He needs you to be Aware, he can't, this is not the time to go to sleep. Uh, this is not the time to sit and relax. Uh, the Bible says in Proverbs, a little slumber, a little sleep, uh, and one is brought quickly to destruction. This is the time to be awake. And so we call 21 days of prayer. Let's get together on a Wednesday night. Let's seek the face of God. And truly we believe that, 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 that God will heal our land if there's a people that will humble themselves and pray. Then for crying out loud, let's humble ourselves and pray. Because six months from now, we may be too late to humble ourselves and pray. And you're going to look back and you could possibly say, how in the world did we get this, ourselves in this mess? And you have to look at yourself and say, maybe I had a part to play in it. Because God can... I'm not trying to bring no shame and condemnation, but if the conviction hits you in the eye, receive it. 
Because God can only do what he's released to do. It's yea and amen, it says. You say it, and God says amen. He can't, we have to come into agreement with God. We have to declare it. God says, yes, that's my kingdom. That's my will. It is going to be done now on the earth. We have to stick our heads up into the heavenlies, and we have to see what God wants to do in the earth, and then we bring it back down into the earth, and we speak it into this existence. We declare it. We petition it, and God goes, yes, that's what I've been wanting to do. But he can't do that unless there's a people that pray and and seek his face and get an understanding of what his plan is for this moment. Am I talking to anybody this morning? If you're just sitting there watching, you know, the news and complaining all the time about what's happening, and you're doing more watching and complaining than you are praying and seeking, then it's on you. Oh, it's tight, but it's right. Y'all didn't come for this, I know. But I love you. And this is the time for us to rise and shine and for us to seek the face of our God. History matters. Isn't it funny? The word history, his story. His story matters. And inside of every single one of us, his story is already playing out. Did you know this? That inside of you, when you were born as a little baby, there was a little bit of the DNA of great, great, great grandpa Adam. Oh yeah, the one that messed up to begin with. <laughs> and inside of you is also the DNA of maybe your, you know, of your, your forefathers have gone before you, four mothers, who, is it four mothers? Is that such a word? Four mothers and four fathers who have gone before you. And you carry within you their DNA. You carry within you your dad's DNA, your mom's DNA. And, 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 and that may be, uh, has brought you a blessing or it may have brought you a few curses, you know. But everything that you are and experiencing has, is a culmination of things that have happened perhaps hundreds and hundreds of years ago. You perhaps are walking in a blessing that really started 300 years ago. Or perhaps you're walking in, in some kind of a conflict that perhaps started 500 years ago. Blessings even go to a thousand generations. The Bible says curses go to a third generation. History is always working inside of you. So here's what I came to understand. Prayer is so important in this hour. And guess what? Here's the beautiful thing. Prayer is unending. Do you ever think about that? When does a prayer stop being a prayer? Or you say a prayer, and you're like, okay, and it didn't happen. I pray it didn't happen. Well, what, what, what happened to that prayer? Did it just like float off into nowhere? Just fall onto the floor? What happened? Did it disintegrate? What happened to the prayer? Can, here's some good news this morning. Prayer has no ending point. Until it's answered. So some of you are the answer to prayer that was prayed maybe on the Mayflower. Or maybe, you know, in Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Or maybe it was a prayer prayed by some great, great, great aunt years ago who prayed for her descendants that they would follow hard after God and that they would seek Him with all of their heart and, and that her descendants would, would be people that would arise and shine when the world got crazy and somehow that prayer just kept circling the earth and circling the earth and circling the earth until finally you rose up and you received Christ as your Lord and your Savior. You stepped up to the plate and that prayer came zinging right into your heart and God goes, now, Aunt Betsy's prayer is coming to pass and I can do what she prayed 340 years ago. <laughs> Mama, don't you stop praying for your little child. Your prayers don't stop. They just get bigger and bigger and bigger. The Bible says the Lord stores up the prayers of his saints in the heavenlies until finally it comes to a tilting point and they just kind of tip back over into the earth into an answer. Prayers are powerful. And prayers prayed by our forefathers years ago need to come and find an agreement with somebody in our day and time. We need to stand and begin to just say, I come into agreement with those prayers that have been prayed from our, even our founding fathers. People like 
George Washington, who prayed for this nation, that it would be a nation that, that would follow after God, who would say, George Washington himself would say, a nation that does not have, uh, that does not have virtue is a nation that will come to its demise quickly. And a nation can only be democratic to the degree that it has virtue. And you lose your virtue, you, you, you lose your democracy. And so what we're seeing is a nation that is losing its virtue, its integrity, its righteousness. And as a, as a result, it's lost its way. And so what does it need? It needs an awakening. It needs a revival. It needs a return. And how does that happen? Do you just wake up and suddenly there's an awakening, a spiritual awakening that's taking place in our country? No, it comes from a people that are broken and contrite in heart who cry out to God and say, Oh God, we break, we plead, we beg, we, we weep, we petition you, Oh God, for our country that you founded so supernaturally 240 years ago. Oh God, would you come and breathe another awakening into our land we ask you in the name of Jesus our Lord and our Savior bring us back to our roots come on the question is will you be awake in this hour or will you fall asleep at the wheel you know the problem with leprosy is you lose feeling in your appendages. It's really not a very painful disease. You just lose feeling. You lose feeling, so you touch things with your fingers and it's hot and you don't even know it's hot until it burns your tip of your finger off. You, do, you stump your toe and stuff, you don't even know you stumped your toe and you look down and your whole toe's sideways and crooked and then they get, get infection sets in, gangrene and starts r- rotting off your leg. It comes from a lack of feeling. And I feel we are in a place in our nation where there's just no feeling anymore. Spiritually. We don't feel. We're just walking around numb. And the Lord is challenging us as his people, as his bride, as as his, his chosen church to feel again, to arise and to shine. Some of our prayers need to be, oh God, let me feel what you feel for this nation. Let me hurt. Let me be in pain as you are in pain for this land, oh God. Mm. Hebrews 11. We call it the Hall of Faith chapter. I love this chapter. I mean, it talks about all these incredible men, women of God who did great exploits in their time. They would pray and they would do things and God would just intervene and just do miracles. Samson and David and Elijah and Abraham, Moses and Esther, all these great people. And you go, wow, man, this is so incredible. You need to read it, Hebrews 11. Except for the last five verses, which you could probably just like, I wish they wouldn't have put that in there. Because you're reading about all these heroics that were being done by all these great people. Women even received back their dead, you know, all these miracles. And then, and then, and then it says this, and, and then there were others. Mm. Others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some of your brothers and sisters faced jeers and flogging. Even chains and imprisonment were put to death, some by stoning. They were sawed in two. Sawed in two. Killed others by the sword. Some being ridiculed because you weren't allowed to fit into the community. We had to label you as a heretic and so we would make you wear sheepskin or goat skins, and so they would walk around basically being labeled as a heretic, destitute, persecuted, mistreated, and the world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts, some in mountains, living in caves and some in holes in the ground, just trying to live. And these were all, this is so confusing, commended 
for their faith. Well, well, commended. You would think if you had faith, you would be this person that had this great miracle happen, right? That you stood your ground and God intervened and now everybody else turned around like, you know, like Daniel or like the three Hebrew children. They changed everything because they stood. They, but no, the, these guys never saw a victory like that. In fact, they were sawn in two. They were killed. They were stoned. They were flogged. And yet they're commended for their faith. Yet none of them, get this, receive what had been promised. Now watch this. Since God, why? Here's the question, why? Why, why didn't they not receive what was promised? Because God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be perfected. One translation said, would they become complete? One, another translation says that would they bring to an end or accomplish what God had purpose for them? What are you saying? I'm saying that there are some people that live their life and you would think, well, look, you know, this killed them or that killed them and God didn't do a miracle there like we say he can do, but it wasn't that. It was that God had a bigger picture. And when you look at the bigger picture and put that in context with this, then it all makes sense. And now that makes sense. In other words, what God is doing is he's saying, I can't finish in this generation what is needed till the next generation grabs the baton and continues the race. So I grabbed my wife's baton. Basically, it's a vacuum cleaner attachment. <laughs> but it serves the purpose this morning. Every generation has a baton. We are only one generation away from dropping the baton. And it all be gone. Everything depends on the ability of the next generation to reach back and to grab a hold of what the past generation is reaching forward to give them. These people in Hebrews chapter 11, they, they died these incredible, torturous deaths, but yet in the same process they were passing a baton, and yet we are told in Hebrews that their life was made complete. In other words, everything that they lived for now makes sense and brought to it power into the future because we were able to grab a hold of what they declared and what they said and make it now manifest in the earth. And so now us, together with them, makes everything complete. So, interesting that you're here this morning to tell the story. So my wife and I left Baltimore, Maryland, and came back to this little town in the southwest corner of Missouri to live with my parents and regroup until the next phase of our lives would open up. Never thinking ever twice that I would never be in ministry we just were waiting for the phone call, the open door, the whatever. And so we moved in with my parents. She's now pregnant with our first child. And one month led to two months and two months to three months and doors were not opening. There were no doors at all. And money's getting tight. I got a construction job and we're working away and she's getting larger and eventually she has our child. And <laughs> And we're still plugging, I'm still working construction. And listen, I'm not a construction guy. I tell you, I, in, fact, <laughs> in fact, when I was on this crew and we had finished up, uh, just really uh, finishing out a beautiful garage for this guy. It's taken us weeks to get this completely done. 
And uh, so the last job, I was supposed to roll insulation out in the top, uh, in the rafters. And everyone's gathering up their equipment so they could go. Everything's painted. Everything's done. Everyone's excited. Just now, JP's up there putting the insulation. And next thing you know, two legs come flying down through the <laughs> ceiling of the shed. Oh, I don't even know why they kept me on. And I'm there working and making out a living. And I remember one day I came to this realization that I may never be in ministry again. It was a shocker to me. I thought it would never come to my mind. I would never be in full-time ministry. And so I went to the pastor. I said, hey, listen, I just, you don't know anything about me. But I just want to serve. And so we, he goes, sure, man. I want you to make cassette tapes for us. Remember cassette tapes? You know, so I, I made cassette tapes for this guy. And uh, put them out in the foyer in the Sunday mornings, made sure everybody had copies of the sermons that he had preached the week before. I did the yard work, did the landscaping around there for him, did everything I could just to be a servant. And I remember praying this prayer. I took a walk one night. I said to my wife, I said, Melissa, I got to take a walk. I got I to clear my head. The baby was still very little. And, and I remember walking down the street and I said, God, thank you for, with tears in my eyes, Thank you for all the opportunities you've given me to, to serve you. But if you are changing my role from this point on, I just want you to know that I'm good with that. And I'm okay with that. I'll sing a hammer the rest of my life and I'll be the best construction guy I can be if I can, if that's what you call me. But all I need you to do is give me grace to do it. Because right now I don't feel I have the grace to do that. And I, I would like to say there was angels shouting, nothing happened. Just, I just prayed that prayer and wiped my eyes and went back home. A couple weeks later, my wife and I were, decided we'd take a walk with our little baby around the block. We did this from time to time. We were doing this again this one evening. And, and my wife, who's very conservative, I'm more of the you know, outgoing, you know, daring guy, she goes, hey, let's walk one more block. Well, one more block around was on a busy highway. Lots of cars, no sidewalks. I'm like, that's not very safe. I don't think we should do that. I'm saying that. And my wife, the conservative you know, safety security guard, says, no, I think we should. I'm like, okay. I'm having visions of picking up you know, the stroller and you know, walking in people's yards, you know, and trying to keep my baby secure, but we did, and there was no traffic for some reason that particular moment. And then we walked around the corner back onto the safe, peaceful street that we lived on, and as we were walking, just turned the corner, there was a couple walking into a house with the Bibles in their hand. And uh, they said, hey. I said, we said, hey. And they stopped and they said, what you doing? I said, we're just walking a little baby. I said, what y'all doing? They said, well, we're, walk we're going into this house having a little Bible study. Would you like to come? I said, yeah, we'd love to come. Grabbed a little hand, pulled her out, walked pat her in the little rear, and walked into this little house. We got in that house, and there was 20 people in there having a Bible study. I said, well, you do this every week? Yeah, we do this every week. We've been doing this for two years. I said, that's interesting. They said, yeah, we, we've been praying that God would send us a pastor. That's what they said. I about dropped Hannah right there on the floor. I was like. <laughs> and that started our church right there. And we served for 11 years. And I talked to everybody I knew about Jesus. I, I went everywhere I could. I was involved with everything I could imagine to be involved in. I started everything I could start. I did everything I could do. In fact, if we had Walmart. We had a Walmart store. If I went to Walmart on any given night, which I tried not to because it would take me hours to get home because I knew so many people there in the store. And, and if I didn't know them, they, they were in our church. If they were in our church, they probably were in our church at one time or knew a friend that, that went to our church. It was crazy. And so I, one day I was driving down this little town, the, down the street, and I'm looking around. I was like, God, thank you. Thank, thank you. I have nothing to say, thank you. But I have to ask you this question, God. What am I doing in this little tiny town? What am I doing here? What is this purpose? What is the purpose of this? 
Why me? Why here? I mean, why, why not New Orleans, Baltimore, all these big cities? Why not? Why here? And God spoke to my heart. He said, because of your great-grandfather. And immediately I knew what he said. He meant. I'd been told a story about how our family ever got there to begin with. We actually were from Nebraska. My great-grandfather was a homesteader up in Nebraska. He cut his house out of blocks of sod, stacked them on top of each other in the side of a ravine with a dirt floor. So they had a bumper crop and were able to build their own building, their own house. And, and when they built their own house, the preacher and his wife and his son and my great-grandfather's two sons, they all lived in this little house together. And finally, after several years, my great-grandfather was like, he said, you know, I'm just done. This is like hard work and you never know if it's going to rain. If it doesn't rain, we lose everything. So we, they had like a cr bumper crop once every five years was the statistics. And he said to his wife, my great grandmother, he goes, the next time we have a bumper crop, I'm out of here. I'm selling the farm, we're out. Shortly after that, they had a bumper crop. He kept his word, he sold the farm, got a horse and wagon, loaded everything up. The preacher said, can we come? He said, Absolutely. The preacher and his wife and their son loaded up with them and they started heading south. He came down through North Kansas and down into Missouri and got to the very south part of Missouri and the preacher said to my great-grandfather, he says, I believe God wants us to stop here. My grandfather said, okay. So my great-grandfather, with his money he had, bought a dairy farm and started being a dairy farmer. And the preacher started, and with my great-grandfather, started home groups, cell groups in the community. And the Lord spoke to me in my heart that day and said, I brought you here to finish what your great-grandfather started decades ago. We have a generational God. I had no idea that my very purpose at that moment in my life was connected to a man that was born before the 1900s. I had no idea that something had been handed to me through time with a purpose on it that I was to grab and to establish. What am I saying? I'm saying that God does nothing in just a time moment. He, he does everything in the context. He's an eternal God. He's behind, before time. He, he does everything and he always has a purpose and a flow. But uh, we have to get in agreement with God, what God is saying for us to do in that moment. I want to ask the worship team to come. I'm not going to be able to stop. <laughs> what God is wanting us to know is that he has handed us this incredible thing called the message of the kingdom of God. This is why I love, even to this day, and I, I mean, we just had a youth retreat a couple weeks ago. I was there on that Friday night. I, we'll have youth camp next summer. Guess what? I'll be there. The, I'll be there with a wheelchair. No, not a wheelchair. I'm not ever gonna, I'll, they'll be, I'll be there with maybe a cane. I might have a cane when I'm 100 years old. And I'll be at youth camp playing kickball. And we'll be playing Capture the Flag and, and we'll be talking about Jesus and I'll be sharing with them about the importance of the kingdom of God in their life because I understand the power of the baton that we have to make sure that there is always a clear, smooth transition from one generation to the other generation. We are a multi-generational kingdom believing people. And it's important that we understand our purpose for the hour and the next generation's purpose for the hour so we can make that transition when our time comes. Because one time you're going to take your last breath. And when you take your last breath, all that really counts is were you able to hand off? Uh, did you make a smooth handoff to your son, to your daughter, to your grandchildren? to your great grandchildren is there a handoff that took place because of you is there someone's life in the future that will outlive you that will be affected and touched because you believed God that you stood in the gap that you trusted God that you stepped out in faith uh, and now you are able to say take the baton and run with the baton 
Sweetheart, you just got to know that this is the time to run. It was Paul in Philippians, he would say, I've run my race. I took the baton. I have done my best. I used to persecute Christians. I used to drag them out of their homes. I used to put them in prison hoping that they would die and be persecuted. I used to do all those things, but God got a hold of my life uh, and changed everything around on the way to Damascus, uh, on my way to persecute some more Christians. And I realized uh, that there is a God who had a son named Jesus, uh, and he gave his life to Jesus, and God turned his life from Saul to Paul. And when he turned his life from Saul to Paul, after three days of being blind, I eyes that were opened uh, and a revelation hit his heart. The Holy Spirit landed into his spirit by the hands of Ananias uh, and he picked up uh, what he called the baton. He ran his race uh, and he ran it with faithfulness uh, and he ran it with perseverance uh, and he handed it off uh, and over and over again you see him talking back to Timothy and he's encouraging Timothy. He's saying, come on Timothy, you can do it. You can do it. Uh, You can do it. Do not forsake your youth. Uh, Do not look down and despise your youth. Come on, you can do it. And I believe Paul made a good handoff. Just like you are going to make a good handoff. Who are you going to pass this thing to? Who's got their hand outstretched? What do you have in your hand? What are you going to give them? What are, you going to, are you going to give them sorry excuses of a weak God? And a God who's sometimes there or sometimes not? Are you going to hand off to this brother, this sister, this young man, this young woman, an understanding that you can trust God in every situation? Listen, this little virus thing, not belittling it, this isn't the first situation we've ever had. Your, 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 your parents faced things like Adolf Hitler and a world superpower overcoming the world. And they navigated through it, through prayer. And before them was World War I and the Spanish flu. And before them, there was a handoff from people in the Civil War where brothers were fighting against brothers and fathers were killing sons. And they sought the Lord through Abraham Lincoln saying, let us call a time of fasting and prayer that God would heal our land. And they navigated from one generation to the next generation to the next generation through an attitude of prayer and thanksgiving and supplication and petitioning the Lord. And my cry to you as a church body, as a pastor, as a shepherd of the flock, I beg you and I urge you, will you stand in the gap? Will you seek the Lord for your nation in this hour of crisis that we are in? Will you grab the baton and will you begin to run the race? Do not sleep on the watch. Be strong and do this thing right and let God do a miracle in our nation. Our Wednesday nights, our Wednesday nights really, I'm telling you, there shouldn't be enough room in this room for this. We're seeking the Lord. We're seeking God for a miracle. I promise you six months from now, you won't have the time to make that prayer. It will already have been done. What are you going to do now? Wake up, church. Take your baton and run the race. Can we stand to our feet this morning, church? I read to you a few weeks ago, I think the words of Abraham Lincoln after he was elected president and he was leaving Springfield, Illinois on a train. And he says to the crowd gathered to send him off. He says, I may never come back again for the journey that God has for me. He says, I love you and I thank you Pray for me that God will help me do what God's called me to do in this hour of crisis. I think today we need to pray for our nation. We need to pray for our leaders. And we need to pray for God to do something supernatural in our land. Listen, our nation is not too far gone. Some people will say, oh, our nation is too far gone. Nothing, nothing, it can't, God can't help you now. 
listen, your, your nation's never too far gone. As long as there's one person praying and seeking God, it's not too far gone. Listen, you don't need a doctor when you're healthy. You need a doctor when you're sick. We need a revival. We need an awakening. We need a move of God now. And that's why we ask. So would you just mind just bowing your heads, closing your eyes for just a second. Let me pray. Before I do, let me just ask this question. You, some of you may be here this morning. You would say, you know, I, I didn't even know I was in a race. Well, my friend, you, you enter the race when you give your life to Jesus. When you surrender your life, when you, when you say, you know what, I'm not going to do my thing anymore. I'm, my gig is up. I'm going to enter the race of, with Christ. And that means you just really, you got to lay down your life. You got to make him Lord. And this morning, I just want to pray. If there's anybody here, and I know there may be some, if you've walked away from the Lord, or maybe, maybe you just never made that commitment to him. This morning, the Lord is waking in your heart. He's asking you, will you just let me be your Lord? If that's you this morning. Heads bowed and eyes closed. And you would say, Pastor JP, I, I want to come to Christ today. I want, I want to make him the Lord of my life today. I'm not going to leave here without my life changed and turned around. I want to surrender everything. I want to give it up. I, I want to be all in for God. If that's you this morning, I'm going to pray for you right where you're standing. But I, I need you to hold your hand up. You, you say, Pastor, that's me. Pray for me. I want to give my heart to Jesus. Would you raise your hand right where you're at? Just right where you're at. Man, that's me, Pastor. I, I want Jesus. Yes, I want Jesus. I want him to be the Lord of my life. Yes. Yes, I see that hand and that hand. Come on, anybody else? I, I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. Yes, yes, sir, yes, sir. I see that hand. Anybody else? I want Jesus. Lord, be my Lord. Be my Savior. I want us to pray, especially those that pray, raise their hand, especially you, you, but everybody, I want us to pray this prayer. I call it a salvation prayer. Can we just agree with me? Can we just say it together? Would you repeat after me? Would you say it like this? Lord Jesus, I surrender my heart to you today. Forgive me from running from you. I pick up my baton and I surrender my life. Thank you for forgiving me and coming into my life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we give God some praise for those that prayed that prayer this morning? If you prayed that prayer, we would ask you just to fill out a connect card and fill it out and put it in your little giving box on your way out. Just mark your name and just say, man, I just accepted Christ. We just want to stay connected with you. For everybody else this morning, we've been doing this last for two services. Uh, do you remember watching the Olympics and the guys like running, you know, with this torch in his hand? Amen. I want you to know you got a torch, you got a baton. Would you do me a favor? Would you symbolically, would you just lift up one hand like you're carrying? Just close your eyes for just a minute. I want you to imagine yourself in your mind's eye, the stadium filled with a cloud of witnesses. And they're all watching you run the race in the arena below. They've all passed in front of you. They've all lived and passed. And now the very baton that you hold, the very torch you hold was given to you by them. They passed on. This morning I charge you to run with urgency and to run with pride and honor and thankfulness. For God has given you such a precious thing called the gospel, the good news. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Father, I charge my brothers and sisters this morning to leave this building today and as they go back into their places of residence and work, play and school, the Lord, they will stand strong carrying this torch of the kingdom of God, the good news. They will not be ashamed and those, Lord God, who have died before us, 
sawed in two, swords in their gut, sleeping in holes and caves in the mountainside for the sake of the truth of the gospel would be made complete by the race that we run. That they would not be embarrassed or ashamed of the race that we now run. That we will, Lord, in this hour of need, stand on the, on the, on the gap and we will intercede for our nation and we will pray for our country. And we will ask you, Lord God, to bring an awakening across our land. Lord, awaken us this morning. Awaken me, Father God. Awaken me, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father, for using us in this precious hour that we have. And for that, we give you the thanks and we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Do you receive that baton this morning? Church, do you receive it? Amen. And amen. We love you. We will see you back here Wednesday night. If you need prayer, we have prayer team right over there. Pray for anything you need. God bless you. Dismiss one row at a time. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>